Um, okay, it's my pleasure to welcome you all at uh, this One World I Am Mathematical Physics Seminar. Um, today we have Nicholas Beisert and uh, he's going to talk about planar integrability and Yangian symmetry in N equals four supersymmetry gag mills. Um, just to remind you all, this uh, seminar is recorded and the recordings will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, please, Nicholas, the floor is yours. Looking forward. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks very much for the invitation um, to this seminar series. It's, it's, it's really exciting to be part of, of such a, um, well, I guess worldwide um, seminar. And uh, it's also good uh, <clears throat> that, that we are using this, this virtual technique and um, especially in these days when uh, politicians uh, seem to look more towards um, polls rather than listening to the science, it's, it's, it's really useful that we can still communicate well with each other in this way. So <clears throat> good, um, so today I, I'm not going to talk about something uh, very recent because, uh, because of various things, but also because I've, I've been somewhat distracted with uh, other uh, matters, uh, which you may have noticed, or some also uh, more of a dependent mental type. Uh, but anyway, I, I, I'm going to talk about planar integrability and uh, young and symmetry, um, in, in in particular, um, supersymmetric gauge theory model. Um, <clears throat> And I will start with a, a more review type or, or some introduction into the subject. Uh, and later on, I want to focus on one aspect of it, um, which, which is perhaps more, more, most interesting from a mathematical physics point of view. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me start with some rather, uh, well, developments from 15 years ago, roughly. Um, so um, this, this uh, whole subject is based uh, in the ADS CFT correspondence. Um, there, uh, one, one motivation for the, or one, one motivation for ADS CFT is uh, that we wanted to, or people wanted to understand strings on curved target spaces um, as compared to strings on, on, a, on a flat Minkowski space. Um, here, the equations are nonlinear. Um, the spectrum is, is uh, vastly more difficult than for strings in flat space. Um, and for example, if you wanted to uh, understand scattering of strings, you, you don't even perhaps know how to get started in this, in this topic. Um, <clears throat> and in that uh, direction, a major achievement was uh, the conjecture of ADS-CFT duality. Um, which relate uh, strings uh, or other gravitational theories um, on particular curved uh, spaces, uh, namely ADS um, type uh, target spaces uh, to conformal field theories, which live on the boundary of this ADS uh, space. <clears throat> and um, well, first of all, that, that makes perfect sense because uh, the isometries of ADS uh, are the same as the or are related to the conformal uh, symmetries of a conformal field theory. Um, <clears throat> and the, the main example for, for ADS-CFT and, and perhaps the one that is best explored is, is the one between uh, two B strings on ADS-5 process five um, target space uh, compared to N equals four supersymmetric young mills theory, um, which is a four dimensional interacting conformal uh, quantum field theory. Um, and why is this interesting? Well, um, or why, why is it nice? Uh, it's, it's nice because these are both highly symmetric models. They, uh, you can make use of the symmetries and, and, and thus they are rather accessible. <clears throat> um, but uh, nevertheless, these are nonlinear models. These are nonlinear quantum field theories. And also this ADS-CFT duality is a strong weak duality. That means that the weak coupling regime of one theory is, is, is related to the strong coupling regime of the other model <clears throat> and vice versa actually. So, um, so you can get insights uh, into strong coupling um, for in one model by studying the weak coupling of the other model, which is, which is nice. 
So the two models, just a lightning introduction to what, what they are. Um, strings on ADS5 cross S5, at least in this context, um, concerns maps from a two-dimensional world sheet um, to, to this 10-dimensional target space, which is uh, a product of ADS5 space and <coughs> five-dimensional sphere. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's basically a two-dimensional uh, nonlinear sigma model. It's, it's a standard quantum field theory. It has two couplings, namely the world sheet coupling, which is called lambda, and the string coupling, which governs the splitting and joining of strings, G string. And uh, if you forget about that, the, the, this, this model, this uh, sigma model, is, is defined by a standard sigma model action, um, which essentially measures the, the area or whatever Riemannian pseudo area of, of, of this embedding of this uh, well, cylinder here into or this two-dimensional world sheet into the target space. And uh, what the, the coupling constant is interesting because it just sits in front of the action and it tells you what is uh, weak and strong coupling. Um, in fact, it's weakly coupled for large lambda as usual. Um, and also I should say the isometries of this uh, model are SU2,2 for ADS5 and SU4 for S5. And a certain supersymmetric extension of that if you if you embed this into a supersymmetric uh, string theory. Uh, but otherwise, this is this is uh, SO 4,2 cross SO6 uh, for, for the isometries of this uh, target space. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, there is a four-dimensional um, quantum field theory, uh, which is then equals for super and mills. Um, it's, uh, it's a gauge field theory. So we have a gauge field uh, usually denoted by a mu. We have four types of fermions. We have six types of scalars. Um, and the gauge group uh, could, be, could be anything, but we typically take SUN uh, for it, SUNC, um, where NC is another parameter that, that we can uh, change. Um, what's interesting about this particular gauge theory is that all fields are massless. Um, they are all adjoint, so uh, in a standard representation of SUN, you would take these to be n by n emission matrices. Um, perhaps even, yeah, they should be traceless for SUN, um, but anyway, that trace would decouple. Um, we have the standard couplings that we all learn from, uh, from QFT, uh, namely non-abelian gauge uh, couplings, Yukawa couplings, and, and phi to the fourth. Uh, all of these couplings are related such that we only have one um, overall coupling constant, uh, GM mills, and also, if you wish, a topological angle. Mm -hmm. And this whole model um, enjoys um, superconformal symmetry. So the uh, Minkowski symmetry extends to supersymmetry and also to conformal symmetry. And altogether, that makes the group PSU 2,2 slash 4. It's a, it's a Lie uh, super algebra. Supergroup. Um, <clears throat> this is a sketch of the action, so it has the standard terms, uh, Young Mills type term, um, uh, yeah, a, a scalar kinetic term coupled to the gauge field, and so on, with a phi to the fourth and a Yukawa type term. Um, the supersymmetry helps you somewhat in, in setting up this model in the sense that. Um, it, or it also simplifies some processes in quantum field theory. It protects some quantities. For example, the beta function, that is the, well, the enormous dimension of the coupling constant here, is exactly zero. Um, it does not renormalize in that sense. Um, but it doesn't mean that this, this, uh, the quantum effects in this model are trivial. Um, it's, it's a very non-trivial model um, with many interesting effects. Um, but uh, all, of, all, all, all of these effects, interestingly, preserve the exact superconformal symmetry. So because you have a beta function, which is zero, um, you don't uh, break this conformal symmetry at the quantum level. Um, <clears throat> it is definitely weakly coupled for small Young Mills. Um, but even that means um, if you want to do any computation, you would do that by... Uh, at small Young Mills, you would do that by Feynman graphs. And even for such simple Feynman graph, the computations are very difficult to uh, perform. 
Um, another important ingredient for this talk will be the planar limit. Um, planar limit in a gauge theory is where uh, you take the rank of the gauge group to infinity, you send the young Mills coupling to zero in such a way that this combination G young Mills squared times N, which is the Utov coupling, uh, remains finite um, and tunable. Um, and the point about the planar limit is that you can, uh, all the Feynman graphs that you can draw on a plane um, have the highest relevance and all the other ones where you have crossing lines will be suppressed uh, compared to these planar graphs. So in the planar limit, only those planar graphs um, survive and that that is in fact a large uh, combinatorial simplification. Um, and also in this planar limit, you can see some connection to string theory quite uh, evidently in the sense that um, if you look at the surface on which you draw the Feynman graphs, and in particular, if you go to very high loop orders, um, you, you see more, more and more such a planar surface uh, without any handles emerge. Um, maybe, you know, the more vertices you have, the more smooth you could uh, at least visualize this. So the corresponding limit in string theory is that you do not allow string interactions. You send the string coupling constant to zero, or you set it to zero right away. There's no string splitting, no string joining, um, but uh, still the world sheet coupling that um, comes because of the uh, cu curvature of the target space um, that is lambda, um, this, this coupling uh, remains. <clears throat> now, if you wanted to do any computations in the quantum field theory and in the gauge theory, um, as I said, you would normally use Feynman graphs and, and that is uh, enormously difficult if you go to higher loop orders, so, such as if you have a graph like this. Um, but it's also very difficult if you have um, lower loop orders, but, but still many legs. Um, just because there are, there's so much uh, sort of kinematical data entering this process and uh, could could be joined by the quantum by by the loops in any with any uh, with a very complicated function, um, it's it's very hard to evaluate such uh, processes. However, <clears throat> the point here is that um, n equals four super young Mills, this uh, gauge theory that I've been talking about, is uh, is integrable in the planar limit. <clears throat> and so is the ADS-CFT dual uh, string theory on ADS-5 plus S5. And the point about integrability is that it vastly simplifies calculations. Um, and for example, the spectrum of local operators is now largely understood um, through uh, integrability methods. And we can even compute uh, such observables, uh, this or perhaps a few others, uh, at finite coupling uh, strength lambda, that is, we, we can uh, go past the perturbative regime um, with maybe numerical methods, but anyway, these uh, seem to be reliable. Um, as a concrete example that I wanted to show you is that um, one can find a simple integral equation for the cusp dimension. Um, the cusp dimension is a certain, well, if you wish, uh, a certain part of the um, spectrum of local operators, but it's also a quantity that appears in, in Wilson loops and in cusps of Wilson loops. Um, and that's why it's called cusp dimension. It's also relevant for scattering amplitudes. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, the, the spectrum of this, uh, of this uh, pair of models, uh, let me just describe that because it's, it's relevant for what comes next. Um, so uh, in, a quant in, a, in, a, in a CFT, you would normally deal with local operators. These are some combinations of the fields um, which are localized at a certain point X in space time. And you can, you can take combinations of the fields, say some polynomials of the fields and also derivatives of the fields and you just combine them in, in a certain way. And that defines you some local operator. And uh, by looking at the set of all such things, you, you have a whole spectrum of, of local operators. In the string theory side, these, uh, these elementary objects here would correspond to certain excitations of the string. In some sense, um, here, uh, if you have a very simple combination, these would be 
it would correspond more to the ground state and the more um, uh, things you add to this uh, trace uh, in which you define the local operator, the higher uh, excitations of the string um, you would be looking at. Um, so these are these are the states um, that we will be looking at. And um, these states have, a, well, if you wish, something like an energy um, for the CFT. Um, you call this the scaling dimension. It's a, it's a fundamental uh, property that describes them um, and that uh, comes about, in, in, of course, in two-point function. If you have a two-point function in the CFT, it will always have this form due to the symmetry. It's the difference of the, of the points or the distance of the points raised to some power, and this power is the is the scaling dimension that that is you can consider something like an energy for such states and in fact in string theory the corresponding um, property of of these string states would be the the energy of these states and and that corresponds to the um, scaling dimension uh, that much just to describe the um, the ADS CFT correspondence and what role integrability here plays um, let me just give you one example what how you can make use of integrability um, to uh, describe a certain non-perturbative quantity in these two models um, and indeed I want to show you how the cusp dimension um, can come or can be computed in practice um, so these local operators um, that I described here, um, these local operators can also be understood as the states of a certain integrable quantum spin chain, um, where basically you would um, look at these various fields and consider each field to be a certain spin configuration. And then you have a chain of such spins. And <clears throat> this turns out to be an integrable system in the end. Uh, it's, 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 uh, well, in mathematical physics, you know these objects as integrable quantum spin chains. Um, however, the interactions here have a long range nature, so they are not just between ne nearest neighbors as, as is usually the case, but uh, between more than two neighbors. Um, in any case, one could come up with uh, certain beta equations that are usually applied to integrable quantum spin chains to obtain the um, energy levels or scaling dimensions here. Um, these have roughly such a form where PK are magnum momenta, and this is a certain scattering phase. And uh, well, such uh, things describe periodicity in a, in a certain state. Um, and these are, in, in some sense, these are consistency con conditions for the states. And once you, I mean, at the end of the day, these are, um, these are equations, one equation for each unknown. Um, uh, the PKs are the unknowns. And so um, the set of solutions for this type of equation is, is typically discrete. And for each uh, such discrete solution, you can plug in into such a formula to obtain the energy. And what's, what's remarkable about the equations that, that um, have been set up in this case is that the coupling constant uh, enters in, in an analytical fashion. So um, you know the complete dependence on the coupling constant for both of these expressions. And thus, uh, in principle, one can obtain, obtain non-perturbative data uh, if, you, if you can find solutions here. <clears throat> A useful object here are the twist two operators um, of spin S, or these would also correspond to certain strings which are spinning. Um, or local operators, these are just two fields with a certain number of derivatives uh, inserted between them. Uh, from that, you can compose a local operator. Um, and uh, the number of derivatives basically tells you the spin. Um, such twist two operators have, have been observed in many, uh, or have been investigated in many situations, in QCD, for example, in uh, in scale violations and deep elastic scattering, they play a role. Um, these uh, twist operators also play a role in the DGLAB and BFKL evolution equations. And uh, what I really want to say or discuss here is just the large S behavior of, of these objects. So um, these, these are local operators and they have a scaling dimension for each spin. 
Um, but you can understand or you can investigate this scaling dimension as a function of spin. Um, and the large spin behavior is logarithmic. Um, and the coefficient in front of the logarithm is called the cusp dimension. So that's, that's rather than having a whole list of um, scaling dimensions that you want to observe, this is just sort of the leading uh, log s behavior um, <clears throat> that uh, you can try to extract. And you can try to extract that using these equations. You need to find a certain configuration of momenta and then um, adjust it to, to the lambda dependence. Um, <clears throat> Here, because this is a large, uh, large S uh, behavior, this, this uh, uh, algebraic type equation eventually turns into an integral equation of, of this type. Um, so it's an integral equation for the function psi. Um, there's a certain kernel K um, involved um, that is convoluted with this function and you just have this, well, um, Standard type of integral equation. The kernel, you can uh, make it up from the Bessel functions, uh, Bessel zero and Bessel one. Um, uh, it's just nice that you can actually write down the complete uh, integral equation and functional dependence here of the kernel. Um, there's also a convolution that, that plays a role. Um, but uh, once you find once you find a solution to this integral equation with certain boundary conditions, um, uh, then you can subs or then you can evaluate this solution at zero, and that gives you the cusp dimension. That is sort of the uh, well uh, continuous or an um, thermodynamic limit of this uh, equation. And, uh, excuse yes. me. I mean, the better ansatz means that that there is some uh, kind of spin chain behind this. Is, is yes. It, yes. So so this uh, spin chain. I mean. This spin chain comes from uh, several insertions, or I mean, what? Uh, how how one should understand this? Okay, um, so the spin chain here is is for this type of operator. It's just a two side spin chain. You have two sides, and basically these uh, derivatives can act on either this side or that side. So it's a, if you wish, it's an infinite dimensional representation of I guess here it's SL two. Um, <clears throat> Where, where the spin just says how many derivatives act on each side. And um, then uh, sort of the, you can compute the scaling dimension for such an operator and that you can do perturbatively using Feynman diagrams, which you, in some sense, you stack them on top of this, um, on, 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 I mean, on top of this uh, spin chain on, on these two sides, um, these are, if, if you had a Feynman diagram, you, you can sort of put uh, the two fields coming in here, then they interact in a certain way with, uh, well, uh, vertices and so on, and something comes out and the logarithmic dependence of this diagram at the end of the day gives you the scaling dimension. And that also can be represented through a certain Hamiltonian that acts on these two sides. Um, the funny thing is here that we don't really know the Hamiltonian um, exactly. We, uh, it, it would be a perturbative series, um, which is very hard to express. Um, we've, we have the first few orders for it. Um, it can be computed using Feynman graphs, but using integrability, um, one can cast the whole thing into a set of equations, um, which, involves a certain number of uh, assumptions, but, but these equations um, is what we believe describes uh, such, such a system here. Yeah, so, so in this better answer, what, what are the parameters P, PK, for instance? PK is, is sort of you, you, um, you view each of these derivatives as, a, uh, as an excitation that can hop around between those two sites. And PK is the momentum uh, with which it uh, goes along these two sides. It's, it's not a perfect, uh, perfectly good example to have just two sides. Suppose you have many sides, 100 sides, then the momentum of each, you know, how the momentum hops around makes much more sense if you call it a momentum. But, but here, 
it still extrapolates nicely to this uh, small situation. And, and so in this product, you, uh, you multiply over all pairs of, of such. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, so I, it, it, it just follows the standard philosophy of, of beta equations. Well, really going back to beta himself is that you have you have s types of uh, excitations. This m would probably be the s here. Um, <clears throat> you have s s uh, of these excitations, and they hop around on on the chain, and they can hop around hop across the other excitations. And for each hopping uh, across another excitation, you pick up a scattering phase, and that's the scattering phase that you that's something you can compute. Uh, as a function of the two um, magnon momenta. And also um, due to supersymmetry, you can find the exact dependence on lambda as well. And that's, that's basically how you get to um, such an equation. Um, and making and the assumption, yeah, sorry. And here, the, 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 this is for this, uh, this planar, I mean, the, you, you assume that only planar graphs are, Relevant or? Uh... Yes, um, right. Planarity plays a role in the sense that that you have a certain ordering. Um, <clears throat> if if you take non-planar effects into account, uh, sort of this this uh, chain, this um, uh, well, this circle could be splitting up and joining into other configurations, and that's simply something that the beta equations uh, cannot deal with. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean, it's good uh, that you ask. Um, hopefully it explains a bit better what's, what's going on. But um, <clears throat> here at the end of the day, uh, because we have many excitations, you can simplify these uh, uh, discrete equations into something of an integral equation, something more continuous. And uh, well, you can then expand, you can find a solution and expand it, say, for large lambda or for small lambda. For small lambda, um, <clears throat> you can, well, once you find the solution perturbatively as a power series in, in lambda, um, <clears throat> you can subs, I mean, you can evaluate the cusp dimension at small lambda and you get such a power series. Um, and this can be extended up to, I, I, probably has been done up to 50 orders or so by now. Um, and um, the nice thing is that this cusp dimension also appears in certain processes in the gauge theories, such as in gluon scattering amplitudes, and that has been computed to five loops. And then all these uh, first five orders uh, agree very much with, with that calculation. So there is, um, there is some evidence that these equations that, that we propose are indeed correct. On the other hand, you can also expand it, uh, expand the solution around large lambda. Um, you would find then a different distribution uh, to start with, but um, this can also be done. And uh, what this corresponds to is, is the classical energy of a uh, spinning string configuration um, with certain quantum effects, which are governed by higher orders in, in one over square root of lambda. And even there, uh, the first few orders have been compared with uh, string theory calculations. So to summarize that, um, you can compute this uh, cusp dimension numerically at, at finite lambda, um, and it does interpolate smoothly between the perturbative gauge theory regime and the perturbative string theory regime. Um, you know, in, in green and blue, you would see some perturbative power series extrapolations from these two perturbative regimes. And, and the exact, well, numerically exact solution here uh, interpolates nicely between those two. So um, it gives you good confidence that actually these two models um, are related and that this, this red line is, 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 is a good uh, interpolation uh, between the two, um, which describes either of the two models at at finite coupling. <clears throat> so in that sense, this would um, this this integral equation would describe an exact result in a, in a planar four-dimensional gauge theory at finite coupling. 
Um, <clears throat> so let me show you what, what has been achieved in, in, in terms of this chart. Um, here is the uh, Toft coupling lambda, which is uh, which you have either in string and gauge theory. And here you put uh, one over the rank of the gauge group or also the string coupling constant according to the ADS CFT dictionary. And uh, if you if you just say, if you plot what is classically um, accessible, the classical strings would live in this corner um, and the classical gauge theory uh, lives uh, here on that side of the diagram where lambda is small, here lambda is large and, and I think classical strings you can also only do really when g string is, is small. Um, perturbative gauge theory is, is going away from this classical region into the middle. Um, classical strings you can either do interacting classical strings or free quantum strings go in either of these two directions and thus approach the middle of this chart. The planar ADS CFT correspondence sort of uh, governs this, this part here. And that's where we find integrability and that's where we can actually um, yeah, find a connection between those two perturbative uh, regimes between string and, and gauge theory. Okay. So um, <clears throat> yeah, let me just summarize uh, what, what has come out of this, um, uh, these investigations during the last, uh, well, 15 years or so. Um, we have now understood the implications of integrability for several types of observables. Um, they have been applied to compute certain quantities at finite coupling, as I showed you, um, but, but many more examples are now known. Um, this is all based on well-defined mass concepts at the leading weak coupling order, as, as, I, as I emphasized, um, these are spin chains uh, in, in the leading weak coupling order. It's our nearest neighbor spin chains, which are quite well understood in, in mathematical physics. Um, <clears throat> but also some of the perturbative fractions are under good control now. Um, it's also well understood what is the integrability in, uh, in the classical string theory on ADS5 plus S5. Um, but it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a new kind of symmetry um, for a four dimensional gauge theory, uh, which happens only in the planar limit. But all of this uh, leaves a bit open what is integrability in the first case, uh, in the first place. Um, what, 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 how to, uh, really grasp this, this feature um, that, that enables such calculations. And in particular, I mean, it's, it's, it's well understood what is integrability for, um, for standard quantum spin chains, but once you put the perturbative or the um, finite coupling, uh, or you enter the finite coupling regime, it's not so clear what is integrability. So the question is how, what, what could we, uh, set up to prove this integrability in a, in a more formal sense, rather than just uh, uh, giving some calculations that seem to give the right results. We, we really want to have proofs in the end. And in that sense, um, uh, Youngian symmetry um, comes in, in very handy. So the aim is that we want to prove this uh, Youngian symmetry um, for integrable planar gauge theories, such as N equals four super young mills. And the Youngian is, is here understood as a, um, a symmetry enhancement uh, in a certain hidden way. Uh, you enhance the symmetries of the theory, which is in this case, uh, the super conformal symmetry um, given by the Lee super algebra PSU 2,2 slash four you extend it to a Youngian type uh, quantum algebra, um, which um, at least for, for quantum spin chains is, is, is also a well-defined uh, concept, but here um, it has to be extended a bit. Um, so the outline of the remainder of this talk is, and let's see how far I will get, but I want to show you what is this Youngian symmetry of uh, planar N equals four super young mills. Um, I also want to show you that it leads to a certain Ward Takahashi type identities for correlation functions. Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, tree level and loop correlation functions. 
and uh, maybe also um, how this Jungian algebra um, can cope uh, with gauge transformations and gauge um, and 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 uh, gauge fixing actually, because this is a, a gauge theory in which uh, you can perform computations only after you've uh, after you perform gauge fixing. General assumptions will be that it's it's all about n equals four supersymmetric and mill theory. Uh, it's all in the planar limit, but uh, something very similar would be applicable to other integrable um, gauge theories, such as n equals six supersymmetric chern simons theory, which is also known as the AVJM model. And there may be a few more examples of this kind, uh, but but altogether they are probably uh, rare examples. Um, so first of all, um, this this Jungian is supposedly some symmetry, but symmetry in, in what sense? Um, I, I already introduced the spectrum of local operators, um, but the point here is that this spectrum is not invariant. It is, it is invariant under conformal symmetry, but it's not invariant under Jungian symmetry, um, uh, in, at least not in the way uh, yeah, certainly not in the way that it's it's normally used. And the reason here is is not that it's uh, the symmetry is completely broken. It's it's merely broken by the boundary conditions you choose for the local operators. It is it is still something that is that is there, but it's it's not quite <laughs> it's not quite there, and definitely not for local operators. Uh, and in particular, if 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 it would really be a symmetry. Because this is an infinite, infinite, infinite dimensional symmetry, it would make the spectrum too simple. So it's a good thing that it's it's not there. Um, there are some observables where you might expect this to be a proper symmetry, but then these observables are often plagued by infrared and ultra, ultraviolet divergences, uh, and they obscure the symmetry. So it's even there; it's not so easy to understand what's the symmetry. Uh, I, I really want to just uh, point out it's it's more of an ordering principle or algebraic constructions that can be done using this Jungian symmetry, uh, perhaps uh, towards uh, towards getting a proof of uh, well, of having such Jungian symmetry and thus uh, well having some handle on on claiming that the theory is indeed uh, integrable by proof. However, um, <clears throat> there's one object where you can uh, show invariance, and that would be the action itself. Um, for, for any type of uh, well, Noether symmetry, at least, um, you would expect that the action is invariant under the symmetry in order to call this thing a symmetry in the first place. Um, <clears throat> but it's not so easy to prove that uh, the, the action of your theory here is Jungian symmetric, um, and there are several complications. Um, it's it's the type of representation that's nonlinear in the fields. Um, you also have to deal with cyclic boundary conditions, uh, which doesn't work so well with Jungians. Um, the implementation of the planar limit is difficult anyway. Um, the way a planar limit is usually uh, extracted from a gauge theory is that you perform the calculations, and at the end of the day, you well, you may restrict to planar diagrams, but um, uh, but at the end of the day, you just send n to infinity. Um, but you cannot really start with something um, that implements the planar limit from the start. So uh, here, the symmetry should be valid only in the planar limit. So you, it's it's sort of difficult to uh, get started with it. Uh, furthermore, this symmetry has certain non-local properties, and non-local properties always make symmetries difficult. And you can also wonder about quantum anomalies, which is which is certainly a nice uh, subject in its own. <clears throat> so, what's the what's the Jungian algebra? It's a it's a quantum algebra. It's a Hopf algebra. Um, it has certain algebra relations. Um, here, it's it's based it's based on a Lie algebra whose generators are J A. Uh, and you add another copy of these, uh, which you call J hat A. And um, these are the standard Lie algebra relations, the um, structure constants of the Lie algebra. In this case, it would be PSU 2.2 slash 4. 
And for uh, the mixed uh, Lie brackets, you would impose uh, uh, these. Uh, so which is just saying that the hatted generators transform in the adjoint of the unhatted generators. And then there are certain types of uh, Jacobi identities, which are called SER relations, um, which are much like the Jacobi identities, except that there are some, uh, yeah, some nonlinear contributions, which you can only have in this, in this quantum algebra. Um, and well, these, these are sort of necessary to make it an interesting non-trivial quantum algebra. On the other hand, there's the coproduct. Um, the coproduct tells you basically how to deal with uh, tensor product representations, if you wish, at least in terms of physics. And they also define how you act on spin chains. So in, in particular, if you are interested in spin chains, um, this is a sequence uh, of, of certain representations. And the coproduct tells you exactly how your um, algebra would act on such a multiple tensor product. Um, this here is the standard. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, what about commutation relations between two hatted uh, J's? Um, well, there these are not explicitly given. These are just implicitly given through these ser relations. So you do not say what is J hat commuted with J hat, but instead you say that this J hat commuted with J hat should satisfy a certain type of Jacobi identity, which is the SER relation. Yeah, and uh, so so is, is it a half algebra? It is. OK. Yeah. Um, so the point here is that um, you have a trivial coproduct. So um, if you act on, on two sides, this, this trivial coproduct for the Lie algebra means that uh, for a coproduct, you act on the first side and you act on the second side, and the sum of the two gives you the representation on two sides for a Lie algebra. Whereas the level one uh, extension of the Lie algebra, which sort of generates the Youngian, um, has certain nonlinear terms in addition. <clears throat> and the point is that this, this whole object here is a, is a Hopf algebra. So the, these additions that you put in here, you need to make compatible with this side. And these two green terms here uh, are just uh, have to be aligned in, in a certain way that uh, it, it, it comes out as a proper Hopf algebra. <clears throat> but what's interesting about these is that this, this is something you would consider a local um, action. It acts locally on the sites. Whereas this one is it also has a bilocal contribution in the sense that um, if you act on two sides, you act on with a level zero generator on side one and side two at the same time, and you combine that with the structure constants in a certain way. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, this, this is why you would call these level one generators bilocal, and that's in some sense why you lose locality of your of this of this symmetry. Um, let me not just go into that. Um, but uh, this this here defines formally what is the algebra. And let's now see how you act on the objects of your gauge theory. So in a gauge theory, you have definitely a field. And this model is special in the sense that all fields are adjoint. So all fields are n by n matrices. Um, these might be scalar fields, might be fermions, or the gauge field itself. All of them are n by n matrices. And let me just summarize them through uh, the letter Z. Um, Zk is, is any, any of the fields. And um, <clears throat> if you take products of the fields, um, then it's, it's still a matrix. So for example, phi times psi times psi. Um, is a product of three matrices and itself is a matrix. And um, under SUN, it still transforms covariantly. All of these fields, maybe except for the gauge field, they all transform covariantly by, a, a, by some rule like phi going to U, phi U inverse. And if you combine fields in this, in this way, um, you still have a covariant transformation rule. The whole object transforms by conjugating it with uh, transformation matrix. 
However, what's important is that the ordering of the fields matters. So if you have um, <clears throat> phi times psi is not the same as psi times phi. And if you have more than two fields, then the ordering certainly matters as well. So <clears throat> what we will consider here is field monomials. So any, any sequence of these fields, uh, you can also add derivatives. So d phi or d psi or d squared phi or d squared psi. These would all be letters and you, you form words out of these letters. And these are then what you would call field monomials. Um, in fact, almost all interesting quantities in, in where are we? Um, almost all quantities in, in a quantum field theory are described through field monomials. These local operators are traces of such field monomials where all the fields are evaluated at the same point. Wilson loops, um, when you expand them uh, for small fields here, um, <clears throat> these are all also field monomials. You expand, uh, if you have a Wilson loop, a path ordered exponential of the gauge field starts out being one, but then there's an integral over A or two integrals over two A's, but these are all field monomials. Um, scattering, uh, no, these are, um, uh, correlation functions. You have a correlation functions of n fields at n points. Um, you write it as as a product of uh, of these matrices evaluated at different points. Uh, and these are all different types of fields. Uh, these are well, these are color ordered, if you wish, uh, correlation functions. Um, these are standard objects in the quantum field theory that you might want to compute. And also, the action itself is a field. Uh, monomial or polynomial. Um, so uh, the action is the integral of the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian has a term like f mu nu squared, and that's a field monomial, and all the other terms are also field monomials. So, so all of these objects are field monomials, and uh, we want to understand how this Youngian acts on such monomials. Um, <clears throat> that's anyway how normal symmetries like uh, Minkowski symmetry, translations, rotations, um, and superconformal transformations can be uh, transformed. Uh, if you want to transform a field monomial with a certain symmetry generator, you would act on each of the uh, fields individually and you sum over all positions and that, that is the action on the monomial. Um, so for example, if you're interested in translations, translations would be generated by a by a shift operator. A shift operator is, 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 a, is a derivative or a covariant derivative. So uh, you would act with a derivative on the whole thing, which is the same as acting on each of the factors individually. Um, that's how standard symmetries act on field monomials. And the Youngian does not act so differently. But uh, if you act with this level one generator on, on a field monomial, um, you would act on two of the fields at the same time with two of the conformal generators, JA and JB, and you con 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 um, contract them with the structure constants. And then you sum over all pairs. And, and, uh, and that's, that's basically the level one Young in action that you get from, from this co-product rule here. Um, <clears throat> plus there can also be local contributions, J hat. Um, <clears throat> so in fact, these local contributions, you could also view as, as a sort of um, uh, local completion of the bilocal terms. If these bilocal terms, you have two insertions into the spin chain, if they come to close, uh, they would act both on one side and, and this J hat basically tells you what to do with, uh, with a single side action. Um, a major complication anyway, is that it's a nonlinear action of these, uh, these generators on the fields. Um, <clears throat> and um, so for example, if you act with a momentum generator on a field, this is like using a derivative acting on the field. Um, but in, in a gauge uh, field theory, you would use a covariant derivative and a covariant derivative is either, it's, 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 it's sum of the uh, partial derivative plus the commutator with the gauge field. And in that sense, it's nonlinear because it maps a single field Z to either a single field Z with perhaps a derivative, that doesn't matter, but 
also it can map it to um, a commutator of two fields, and that is nonlinear. But this is nonlinear only if you act on, on single fields, whereas if you insert this into a field monomial, you don't really see this as a nonlinearity because the nonlinearity is in, in the monomials themselves. It's just a linear action on polynomials, right? Um, so it's a proper action um, of these generators on a, on a linear space, but uh, the rank of the poly polynomial can, can, can be changed by, by the action of these generators. And that, that's what makes it rather non-standard. It's not really a co-product rule that you're applying. <clears throat> anyway, um, the, the aim was here to show that the um, planar Youngian, uh, uh, or that the planar action, no, uh, that the action of the of n equals four Supian mills is invariant under the Youngian in the planar limit. Um, the action has certain features that that are really good. It's it's a single trace object. It's it has conformal symmetry. It, it's invariant under conformal symmetry. It's also finite. So in some sense, the the beta function is zero. So it does not receive certain quantum corrections. But there are also some features that makes this difficult because, well, you have not only single trace, but it's also cyclic, um, which doesn't quite work together too well with this definition. Cyclicity does not work here too well because you sum over all pairs. That is a certain problem. It's also an integrated uh, object and it's also a non homogeneous polynomial. It has, uh, quadratic, cubic, and quartic terms in the normal way of writing it. And the task was to reconcile these, uh, these features with the nonlinear bilocal representation, uh, well, mostly with cyclicity. <clears throat> um, we then found a definition for how this J hat acts on, on the single field and also how J, act, J hat acts on S um, such that J hat annihilates the action for n equals four superior mills and for another planar integral model such as AVJM. But J hat S, if you act with such a symmetry um, in a different type of model, which is not integrable, such as n less than four superior mills, if you have plain n less than four superior mills, this is not um, considered to be integrable. And indeed, uh, this definition that, that we found um, does not annihilate the action there. And we can, uh, we can, we've even shown the invariance of the action um, for, for one generator explicitly. This actually generates quite a whole lot of terms. Like if you do it sort of term by term, it might be up to 1,000 terms or so. Um, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, if you sum up everything, they, they all cancel. And in that sense, um, one can argue that this is a good definition of, well, definitely of Youngian symmetry, but, but also of integrability. Um, so we have shown Youngian symmetry in the, in the classical action. Um, the question is, what does that imply for the quantum field theory? Um, so this, this was just uh, you know, some juggling around with the, with the terms of the action, we could show that this enjoys the Youngian symmetry in the way we defined it. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, we can't really make use of Noether's theorem because, uh, well, we don't really have a conserved current or conserved charge here. It's, it's a certain bilocal representation. Um, but we could consider, um, in general, correlators of fields. So these, these field correlation functions, we insert certain fields into space time and compute the quantum correlator of it. These are correlation functions. <clears throat> and then one can write down what Takahashi identities for these correlation functions. Uh, roughly they work, you act with the generator on, on this uh, sequence of fields for conformal symmetry. You would just act on each of the field insertions, sum over all of them, and then the um, correlator should be zero in, in the sum. That is a certain word identity uh, for conformal symmetry. And for Youngian symmetry, you do very much the same. You have, again, these insertions ordered in a certain way. You sum over all pairs um, and uh, apply a conformal symmetry to a pair of fields, sum over all pairs, 
uh, you add up these uh, local contributions as well and altogether that um, should be zero and that would give you uh, some additional identities for these uh, correlation functions. Um, the complication is that uh, N equals four supremes is a gauge theory. Um, so you have to do gauge fixing. Uh, here I write later, but this will unfortunately not happen today. Uh, you have to do gauge fixing that, that introduces uh, a whole lot of additional complications. You can do this through BRST method and show that indeed the symmetry is compatible with BRST. And then at the end of the day, uh, <clears throat> you get much more complicated identities, but they still work. And that's just trying to remove the unphysical degrees of freedom that you have in such a gauge theory. And the point is then that the Youngian does not, well, it's a complication, the Youngian does not close exactly, but it only closes onto gauge transformations, which makes things difficult. So let me just briefly go through correlation functions, um, show you what the results here is that uh, the point is that we, we have a um, <clears throat> non-standard type of symmetry. We've proposed that the action respects the symmetry. Uh, and we want to show, um, we want to obtain some consequences like these uh, word identities for uh, correlators. Um, but we cannot show them in general. We, we can't make use of the normal framework in, in quantum field theory to prove such identities. So we, we just have to convince ourselves that these, um, these identities hold, uh, at least for some uh, easy enough examples. What we looked at is two-point functions, uh, three-point functions. These are the contributing Feynman diagrams to, to such three-point functions. Here, you just have them connected at tree level by <clears throat> one uh, cubic vertex. Um, you can also do a four-point function where you start to get internal propagators that, that in, uh, adds some um, yeah, interesting things. But uh, also the topology, um, you have different topologies that contribute here, this H-type topology, um, whereas here you have an X-type topology. And the symmetry will only relate all three, uh, and these word identities will only relate the uh, some of these three diagrams. And also what happens at loop level, um, for example, three points at one loop would be this one loop, uh, but there can also be very different types of uh, contributions with a loop on a, on a string here and, and also this four point traction. Uh, all of the external fields are off shell, so you have no complications due to uh, uh, massless particles uh, in that sense. Um, <clears throat> Let me just go through some examples before I then stop. So conformal symmetry for propagators works in, in a quite simple way. You have a propagator, you act on both ends of the propagator and the sum should be zero. That is something you get for conformal symmetry. It's not that easy to show, but rather straightforward. Um, <clears throat> so you get an identity of this type. Um, for gauge fields, it's not quite so easy, and that already relates to the gauge uh, theory nature because the gauge field has some unphysical degrees of freedom, and simply these unphysical degrees of freedom should not, I mean, don't necessarily have to be conformal in any way. Um, <clears throat> so what, what you get here is not zero right away, but you get total derivatives, um, which just means that all the gauge degrees of freedom that are contained in the gauge field um, can do something more or less arbitrary. For the Youngian symmetry, uh, the symmetry works in that, uh, such that you act on, on pairs of fields, that is on this field and on that field at the same time. <clears throat> you contract that with the structure constants and you get zero. <clears throat> um, and then indeed that can be shown uh, by shuffling around, uh, sort of doing some partial integrations on, on these uh, fields here. Um, with certain properties of the gate group uh, and, and of the conformal group. Um, so this, this can actually be shown. Um, for the gauge fields, you get something slightly different in the sense that here you get a total derivative acting on both ends of the propagator. That is a curious property for the, for the Youngian. Um, 
for three-point functions, um, I just wanted to give you in comparison what happens for ordinary conformal symmetries. What identity for conformal symmetries is you act on all the external legs, um, <clears throat> but you also get nonlinear contributions. Um, these are what I mentioned earlier. Um, when you act on fields, you sometimes produce two fields. And that is, if you act on this external field, uh, within the Feynman diagram, you get sort of two lines uh, coming out of this point. This, this is sort of a commutator term, typically, that, that you have here. And you have these nonlinear contributions everywhere. Um, the sum of all these diagrams should be zero. How can this be done? Well, you shift, you use the two-point function here, you shift over things to the middle. And for here, what you do is you insert um, sort of a combination of a, of a kinetic term and a propagator, which together form a delta function, but it's just a formal exercise to push everything to the middle. And then you have a combination of these six terms. And these six terms are just uh, what, what you can identify as invariants of the action. And that's how, how things work for ordinary conformal symmetries. It's not, not very easy if you, if you go through the calculation. For the Youngian, but however, it, it works in a very similar way. You write down the same types of uh, terms from the word identities. Uh, you shift things to the middle. Um, and then at the end of the day, you get something um, in the middle, some vertex in the middle. And this vertex is just what comes out of the transformation of the action. And since the action is invariant, this whole thing is, is zero. And well, then you can do it for four points. Um, you get more complicated relations, which now, um, yeah, you have you also have to deal with the internal lines and you need more properties of this Youngian. <clears throat> for loops, uh, it can also be done uh, even still on, on paper. Um, if you if you draw it in terms of diagrams, uh, you don't lose track of what these uh, various things are. Um, <clears throat> well, and uh, you can then show uh, using all the identities that you've used before that altogether they are they are zero if you insert the right sort of vertices for your theory. Okay, you can think about anomalies, uh, but Nicholas, I would I, think, I would run I think into an anomaly yeah. with with the uh, uh, with the hosts uh, if I <laughs> if I continue at this point. Um, but anyway, you you <laughs> can also have a look at the slides and um, uh, ask me in, at any point later. So yeah, the other thing is Youngian algebra and gauge transformations, as I mentioned. Um, you have to show that it's compatible with BRST symmetry. Um, it's, it gives you interesting mathematical structures, which I would invite you to have a look at. But let me just conclude. Um, <clears throat> so I've talked about Youngian symmetry of planar n equals 4 super Young mills. Um, I've, I've tried to argue that the classical action of uh, planar n equals 4 super Young mills is Youngian invariant. And in that sense, this model is, uh, is classically integrable. Um, the uh, Youngian algebra well, uh, can be combined with gauge transformations. Uh, this leads, interested, leads to interesting structures. Uh, might, I mean, here we've done it um, using BRST transformations. It, it might actually be interesting to also apply this in the BV framework, but, but I'm not too familiar with that. <clears throat> and um, what I've shown you is, is that um, these, uh, this Youngian symmetry leads to additional word Takahashi identities, or in, in the context of gauge fixing, also to Slavnov Taylor identities, um, which we have well tested because we don't really know um, better how, how to, well, or what kind of framework we could use to. Uh, formally prove such identities. Um, and, and also it would be interesting to uh, exclude quantum anomalies. Uh, we don't expect them to happen. We expect them to be absent because integrability works so well. But um, of course, we, we also don't really have a, a yeah, formal, formal proof of it yet. Uh, it would be interesting to see if the um, quantum uh, um, 
divergences, uh, whether they interfere in a, in a, in a destructive way with, uh, with this young and symmetry. But in any case, I think this, this gives you interesting new um, mathematical structures for a gauge theory. You have a new type of symmetry that, that acts in, in rather, uh, well, uh, new ways. Uh, and um, it would be really good to have, have a good framework uh, which applies to the planar limit that with which you could handle um, such symmetries and, and make formal proofs or statements. Anyway, um, yeah, thanks for your patience. Um, I should stop, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Nicholas. <clears throat> okay, um, the floor is open for questions. So there were already some questions during the talk, but uh, please, if you have a question now, uh, just unmute yourself and go ahead. <clears throat> Uh, may I ask a question? Sure. Of course. Uh, so, uh, who invented Jungian symmetries? Was it Young? And, and, uh, and uh, if, if so, was it uh, the Young from Young Mills? It, it was Young from Young Mills. Uh, it's, it's the Young from Young Baxter. Um, uh, who invented them? I think it, it was a tribute to him uh, that this name was given. Um, I think it was someone from Leningrad School, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> so, so how, 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 recent, how recent is this uh, concept? Uh, this, um, oh, it goes back to Drinfeld, right? Um, Drinfeld okay. gave the name uh, in yes, 1986. Thanks. Uh, oh, hi, hello, Giovanni. Hi. <laughs> Eighty-six. Yeah, yeah. That that makes perfect sense. And, and another question. Uh, now, uh, what is the relationship of of super young Mills theory to, to 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 QCD? I mean, it's, the, these are different theories. So, how how much do we learn about the physical theory from uh, from this? Uh, uh. Yeah, there there are certain certain similarities between those two models. <clears throat> I mean, what's clear is that that it's the same types of interactions that these two models uh, share. Uh, QCD is definitely not a massless theory, although the standard model is surprisingly close to a formal conformal field theory. Um, in certain aspects, or at least a, a, a symmetry broken conformal uh, theory, um, that because uh, you know um, all the, for example, all the mass terms uh, that you have in the standard model, almost all are just because of symmetry breaking. Um, <clears throat> there might only be some Majorana um, fermion mass term that you have explicitly. But all the other terms are, are really have massless uh, or dimensionless coupling constants, <clears throat> and it's 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 almost conformal. But uh, but certainly QCD is is very different because I mean, if if you actually put the masses of the quarks in by hand, um, well, first physics of all, will be different. The, 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 there is no supersymmetry. At least uh, it hasn't been detected. Yeah, supersymmetry. Also, I mean, I'm I'm sort of mixed. Uh, mixed. I have mixed feelings how how important supersymmetry is. Um, and for the uh, conformals, I mean, for the Lie symmetry on which this thing is all based, the Lie supersymmetry. It's it is actually important that it's a supersymmetry because um, you can get a, a dual Coxeter number of zero in Lie supergroups, but not so in in Lie. Uh, Lie algebras, and that that does play an important role here, um, which which also relates to the fact that you know in in supersymmetry there's always a balancing between bosons and fermions, and so you can get complete cancellations between bosons and fermions, and n equals four super and Mills sort of um, uh, is is very perfect in in this uh, in this type of uh, cancellations. Um, <clears throat> But there, there are certain processes, for example, yeah, for scattering amplitudes um, that are very similar in QCD. Uh, 
For example, there, there is a certain, what is called a transcendentality scheme. Um, you look at the sort of how complicated the functions are in, in, QC, in, in scattering and in QCD. And um, <clears throat> if you just pick the most complicated parts, the most complex contributions, um, those actually are very similar to the ones you see for, I mean, at least for gluon scattering. If you do gluon scattering in QCD and gluon scattering in Young Mills in the planar limit and just the high, the most complicated parts of the functions, they, they seem to be very similar. Um, what, what about the finiteness of, of the super and n equal for super symmetric Young Mills? Uh, so the, does one have to renormalize? You have to renormalize. It's it's not a trivial theory. You it's uh, even though it's called finite, it's not it's not that every calculation you do is is finite. Um, actually, most quantities you have to renormalize if you if you have local operators, all the anomalous dimensions, all the scaling dimensions, all the non-trivial scaling dimensions for local operators come out of divergences, um, which you have to renormalize. Um, uh, it's just that um, the action itself is not renormalized, and that that's what makes the conformal symmetry. Thank you. And then more questions, comments. Can I ask a question? So you sure, go ahead. you explained how how you act with Youngians on on these field monomials, and so one term was this bilocal term, and I understand how it how it acts because it's based on conformal symmetry. But what about the, the local term? Is, is it to be determined case by case, or do you have a general procedure? Yeah, um, that's that's why I, I try to explain it as as sort of a <clears throat> um, what's it called a UV completion, or um, it is something that that defines a representation of the Youngian. But um, because of the nonlinearity, it's not so not so evident what to do there or how to understand it. Um, the point is that we want this. We wanted the action to be uh, invariant, and um, <clears throat> in setting up this here, all of these terms, all of the bilocal terms, are fully determined. Um, there's no flexibility for them. We know how conformal symmetry, well, there's a bit of flexibility, but we know how conformal symmetry works and that, that's how we can just uh, write down exactly what comes here. For these, uh, we just said, well, whatever it takes to, uh, to put here, um, we, we just try to find a good representation such that the action is invariant. And there was a solution for n equals four super young mills, which worked for all the generators that for, for all the fields. And you can also look at the equations of motion. Uh, the equations of motion are also invariant in a certain sense. And uh, there was a unique choice uh, for this um, such that you get invariance. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it, so it's not quite a representation anyway, so it's, it's difficult to say what algebraic properties this single side action should have. Okay. But you have an explicit formula. Yes, uh, yes, okay. yeah. And for, I mean, we have one for uh, N equals fossil bearing mills, we have one for ABJM, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any more questions, comments? Okay, um, I have one question. So you, you skipped, of course, through the BRST story, uh, but I would be interested to find out a bit more. Um, so you mentioned BV. Um, I mean, if you consider situations with gauge fixing, it's usually useful to do it in the BV formalism because in a way you you get independence of the gauge fixing for free. Um, so is, 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 have you thought about it? How, how to uh, combine the Angian symmetry with the full BV symmetry, not just the BRST part? Yeah, no, I, I haven't really thought about it. Um, 
I've, I've thought about thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the first step. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I mean, it's, it, it would be interesting to see if, if, if there's any, any way to make this work and, and whether that helps because the, I mm. mean, the kind of symmetry um, is, is heavily mixed between, I mean, it mixes in the gauge symmetries. So uh, that's why the gauge fixing um, has a rather serious impact on it. And if you do it via BV, it, it might change altogether. It just would be interesting what comes out. I'd be happy to look at it at some point. <laughs> Also with yeah, is, is anybody else thinking about thinking about it? Because that's well, I don't know. Yeah. I, I try. I, I talked to Mikeda um, once. Um, oh, okay. About it, but so far we haven't. Oh, I should. I should ask him if he is also thinking <laughs> <laughs> in that direction. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah. yeah, that that's uh, that's definitely something to look at. Uh, any more questions? Anything else? Okay, so I think we can close for now. So let's thank the speaker again. Thanks.